welcome. I'm Christina McGrath, and Charles and I today are going to be doing neurogenesis. So, Charles. Yeah, so um, neurogenesis, I think, has become a sort of super important subject only because of, um, as you will probably all know, sort of neuroscience has become the new sort of wonder science. Uh, and what they're discovering almost sort of on a daily basis uh, is beginning to change uh, an awful lot of things. So neurogenesis, just to explain exactly what it is, or roughly what it is, I should say, it's a process of how your body and your brain produce new brain cells. And that what they realize that will come through, and that's part, most of what we're talking about today, is that um, new brain cells are actually the key, not a key, the key to enhancing the quality of your life. So, I mean, I'm, what I, the way we've sort of formatted it today between Christina and I is that um, we're going to look at some of the myths that used to exist until quite recently and then sort of look at some of the truths that they're beginning to find, at least truths for the moment. Um, so the first sort of bit, uh, first thing to explain really is that there are two parts to this in a way. One part we won't really talk about because it gets very technical. One is neurogenesis, which is the production of the new uh, brain cells. And the other is synaptogenesis, which is uh, because of new cells or because of um, efficient cells, uh, another area that they've realized is extremely important in having healthy brain cells is this area of synaptogenesis, which is the synapse, which is the connections between cells and the fluids and the hormones and uh, all the neurotransmitters that need to be in the area in order to enable it to happen. And this the, are things that they're beginning to understand that we can do and should control. So the first sort of big myth was that um, it was thought that whenever, um, when you reach 20 years old, that was it, all your brain cells are formed, your brain is fully formed and it's downhill from there. No matter what you do, that's as good as it gets. Um, this they found is completely untrue. Now this was based on the fact that the brain does actually get to fully form by about the age of 20, 21, something like that. Um, and that they couldn't find any, or partly because they didn't have the scanning methods or the uh, analysis methods to actually sort of see, but they couldn't tell whether any new cells are being generated. So they assumed that they weren't and that it was downhill. And in any case, most people get more stupid as they get older, even if they've got more experience. Um, so in the, in the 1950s, this began to change a little bit before the sort of real sort of genesis of neuroscience. Um, and they began to realize that the brain, brain was slightly more plastic, what they call plastic. That meaning that it had the ability to switch its resources, if necessary, to various other areas, and that learning new things was possible. Um, so you weren't stuck with what you've got, and we'll come to that in a moment. Then in about 1990-ish, um, they suddenly, not suddenly, they realized that um, the brain um, could produce new brain cells. And not only did they begin to realize that, more recent science has shown that the importance of these new brain cells. So the truth is, as the myth doesn't show, um, is that the brain reaches full development um, in your 20s, but it keeps growing new brain cells and has this ability to grow uh, new brain cells throughout your entire life, no matter what age you are, no matter what you've got, no matter what you've learned. Now, there are other cases that we won't talk about today about dementia and Alzheimer's and all of that, but we won't get into any of that. So in 1990, a guy called Fred Cage from the SALT Institute, um, began working with better neural imaging with fMRI and all sorts of other sort of systems of seeing and uh, realized that um, new neurons were seen to form in animals, particularly in the hippocampus. Now this is also backed up by the very famous study of the English cabbies who because of their spatial awareness of London, um, because they have to go through this training um, 
in order to learn London called the knowledge that the hippocampus grew as a result. Now, it seems a bit strange that, we, that they didn't realize before then that, that we were generating new brain cells. Um, but they then began to test this um, in mice first, then in monkeys, and now they've proven it in humans as well. So, and what they realized is that um, all sorts of varied conditions are uh, responsible for creating an environment in which new brain cells can not can be produced, but can be um, nurtured. So that is diet, body, heart, meaning emotions, really, your mind and spirituality as well, which is um, probably not what everybody was thinking, but all these things, if optimized, have the ability to uh, increase your quality of life and the health and of your brain as well. So the next myth was that um, aging means cognitive decline and memory loss and it's a downhill slide and all of that. Um, that's not true. Uh, that is not the case. And look, I am living testament to the fact that you can learn new things even at any age. So I am the proof, the living proof. Um, but the, the most important thing about this is that what they found is neurogenesis, and we'll get into how and why a little bit better in a moment, uh, is the key marker for the quality of life that you produce. Um, if you increase your neurogenesis, the amount of um, neurons that you produce and their survival, which is also very, very important, you increase the quality of your life. Um, and if you reduce the, the environment, the conditions under which neurogenesis happens, you will shrink your brain. It's just as simple as that. Proven, shown by fMRI studies and also by studies in mice. Uh, they did a very long study um, studying mice in um, depri depri deprived environments and in enriched environments. And they found that there was a huge difference in the amount of neurons that they produce. Now, their brains are a little bit simpler than ours, of course, but uh, nevertheless, it proves the case. And they, unfortunately, they've done the same study in monkeys, but not quite so popular, of course, nowadays. Um, so, and the other sort of, the guiding thing, and the, the thing that intuitively, I think we all sort of know and sort of comes together with all of this, is that um, the quality of your life does depend on the quality of your brain and your ability to deal with things. Now that, and I think Christina and I have been talking about this for ages, is that brain and body are all one thing. It's all the same organism. If you nurture these organisms, then you will have a better quality of life. You'll have better ability to deal with stress, to deal with um, emotional problems, with uh, physical problems, with all those sorts of things. So the next myth, your genes determine exactly how you're going to age and how long your brain stays sharp. Uh, no. So you, that doesn't mean you, you can improve, you do. Back to the experiment with the mice, <coughs> is that what they found is that um, mice and humans also lose up to 60 or 70% of the new neurons that you produce that they don't get nurtured through to actually sort of become active within your brain. And that an enriched environment, which in the case of mice was pretty simple really, was running wheels, mazes, interesting things, uh, allowed almost all of the new neurons to survive. So that's a huge difference in terms of the quality. And they've proven that now with, um, with chimpanzees and they've they think they've proven it with humans. And certainly that's the, the basis of this whole new wave of understanding called neurogenesis. Um, so enriched environments increased neurogenesis up to four or five times and increased cognitive ability and increased memory. So, and that's sort of now proven. But what that means is the consequence of all of that is better emotional and hormonal ability to deal with stress, resistance to fear, 
and stress and depression. And the, the particular studies that they've been doing recently, and there's one very recent study that's out, is in relation to depression. And we'll talk a little bit about depression, why that happened, because they're now beginning to believe that depression is um, not necessarily caused by, but is certainly um, enabled by a low uh, factor of neurogenesis. So that is quite significant, and it isn't necessarily as they thought, and we'll come to that. Um, in fact, we we'll come to it now about um, SSRIs, which um, SSRIs, NRIs, NDRIs. Um, this is a study by uh, Jessica Malberg in, two, in the year 2000, researching antidepressants and what they did. So SSRIs, if you don't know, and I'm sure you do know, are sort of things that they're called uh, reuptake inhibitors and they, they will uh, suppress or increase or increase the potential uh, within a, a neuron to generate and to work with uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, and you probably know it all as Prozac and stuff like Prozac, uh, which astonished me, in fact. I, it's the second most widely prescribed, prescribed drug in the world. How scary is that? I mean, that is just astonishing. Um, but what they found is that it's not necessarily that, that the serotonin or the norepinephrine or the dopamine is the actual active engagement, uh, ingredient. What it does is it increases neurogenesis. So it increases the ability of neurons to, um, to survive and to thrive. So it's what they realized now, and you'll probably see this in a lot of, um, of um, social uh, work and everything else, is that a lot of depression is now being dealt with, with, um, with meditation, with other types of neurolinguistic planning or um, types of mental control, rather than using drugs. Drugs, I think, they, they obviously still use, but in much more severe cases. <coughs> but there is this undeniable now connection between neurogenesis and depression. And depression is caused by low levels of serotonin, or so they thought. So you would need a lifelong um, um, prescription of SSRI drugs in order to treat it. So that's pretty, pretty, pretty scary, I think. And that's what was the case up until relatively recently. And that's why I think, if I'm not mistaken, Christina, there's a bit of a, an epidemic of, um, of, of actually sort of prescribing these drugs in the US yeah. and people are becoming addicted to them because they can't do without them. Yeah. Well, so what they think is that antidepressants are not what's working it's the neurogenesis that's actually working. So if they can increase the neurogenesis, then potentially you won't need the drug. And this has been proven, as I say, to some extent, not totally, but to some extent, that things like meditation are as effective, and so is exercise for that matter, are as effective as the drugs themselves. So, um, so if you have low neurogenesis, this causes things like memory loss, cognitive impairment, um, chronic stress, and stress sort of debilitates almost everything, depression, um, loss of emotional resistance as well, trauma, reduced immunity as well, so it has an effect on your immune system too, diminished executive function, that is, you know, your prefrontal cortex, uh, that it, it actually doesn't operate as well, uh, which is not very good if you've got lots of decisions to make, um, and a loss of vitality and eventually um, increases the onset of dementia as well. <laughs> and I know that dementia is, is sort of a completely different area of dealing with sort of um, with tau proteins and with uh, amyloid as well and all sorts of other things. So I won't get into that too much, but the point, the whole point of um, this webinar is basically to say that um, you can increase the rate of your own neurogenesis if you do the following things. You look after your diet, you look after your body, you exercise, 
and you look after your emotional health as well and you um, look after your mind so you stimulate your mind as well and the one that really interests me that i'm really curious about is uh, spirituality apparently spirituality is really good for you now i have a slight personal problem with it in one sense in in organized religion but um and i was explaining to um to christina is that um alan de bottom who's a very well-known philosopher has written a whole book about the value of religion within society now religion isn't necessarily spirituality but it, it, it's certainly very closely connected with it so um all of these things increase your um your neurogenesis and also your synaptogenesis as well and synaptogenesis is something we'll come to in a moment with bdnf but we won't go into it too much so what it means is basically that the brain actually determines everything in your life which makes sense because you have no other way of perceiving the world so why wouldn't you want to have a healthy brain and a, and if the, a healthy body helps it to be a healthy brain then that's what you need to do but the other thing is stimulation a really really important part of this of the whole sort of um, philosophy of neurogenesis is that you need to, to be stimulated. You need novelty as well. You need new things. You need different things. Um, so what I think we're sort of getting at really is that you need to adopt a more neurogenesis friendly lifestyle. And that means looking at your diet, which Christine's going to get into in a moment, um, looking at your exercise, which we won't get into today, but I think you all know from the other webinar that, um, there is something called a magic bullet and it is exercise and that stimulates an enormous amount of different things we all know about runners high and all the rest um so every and and if you think about it everything that we experience in any way shape or form is experienced through the brain it's th through our perception so just a very brief bit about um the hippocampus because it's sort of right it's in the middle of your brain somewhere <coughs> it's sort of there are two sides to it. There's a front end and a back end. And it's central. The hippocampus is the thing that is central to um, a huge amount of human consciousness and various sort of functions in human consciousness. <coughs> so it is involved in movement and spatial awareness and spatial learning. And that we know from London cabbies who do the knowledge and they've increased the size of the hippocampus. Interestingly, when they stop, when they retire, it shrinks back. So it just goes to show that you need to keep it up all the time. Um, it's also, the hippocampus is also involved in uh, cognition, in learning, in new memory formation as well, and the processing. Basically, it's a sort of like a little command center right in the middle that says, oh, what should I do with this? Oh, well, let me chuck this one up to memory. Let me chuck this one up to sensation. Let me chuck this one over to fear or whatever it might be, because it's very involved in emotion and mood. It's not the generator of the ocean, emotions of mood, but it does tell the amygdala what to do with it. Um, this all happens in, in less than the blink of an eye, of course. It's all very, very fast. Um, but it's also involved in stress and anxiety and fear and depression as well. Um, and it has a very key role in depression too. Um, the hippocampus is also the part that is most active if you're involved in any form of mindfulness as well, which also fascinated me because I, I had no idea. Um, this is all based uh, on really quite a seminal book by a guy called Brant Courtright, um, who is a clinical psychologist and almost everything in his book is backed up by the science as well and the, the backing of articles and everything. But spirituality, mindfulness, devotion, compassion are all very good for you. So you should do more of it, basically. Um, and the size and the development of your hippocampus, which is crucial, the command center, um, is impacted by all of these different types of elements. And neural growth stimulates something that we call neurotrophins. We're getting close to BDNFs, which we're going to get to. So um, one of the things that enables uh, 
new and old um, neurons to fire with each other across a synaptic gap. So you've got one end here and one end here, and then there's a little spark, if you like, that goes through that certain chemicals, hormones enable to happen. One of the things that, um, that is crucial in all of this is something called BDNF. We've spoken about it before when we talk about optimal um, nutrition. And this is brain-derived neurotropic factor. And what this does is it's essential, not just um, necessary, it's essential for brain development and for synaptic health. And you need synaptic health. Because if you're trying to leap the chasm between neuron to another neuron and you haven't got the legs to do it, you're going to fall down the middle and just end up nowhere. I don't know what nowhere is like in the brain, but it can't be very nice. Maybe that's what depression is. I don't know. Um, so BDNF, if you increase your BDNF, you then increase the possibility of neurogenesis. Um, whereas if you don't and you have low exposure and therefore you will end up with and may um, engender chronic inflammation, chronic stress, which are all part of low BDNF and low levels of neurogenesis, apparently. Uh, and also deprivation causes, um, causes a, has a very strong effect on your ability to produce new brain cells and to produce the right environment for those brain cells to fire across the synapse. <laughs> so basically the brain does everything, but the brain is big, you know, it's not just inside here. It also goes all the way down your spine and there's a lot of talk recently uh, and has been for some years about the gut being completely and intimately involved in the brain's process as well, which you know, makes you wonder um, why we don't realize more straightforwardly that what you ingest is going to have an effect on you. I mean, if you drink coffee, it does have an effect. If you drink alcohol, it definitely has an effect. If you drop uh, drugs or acid or whatever it might be, you know it's going to have an effect. I don't know exactly how LSD works, so I won't go into that. Um, but my nephew does, and he'll bore us to tears with it. But anyway, so um, brain basically controls everything. Everything you do, everything you ingest affects your health, and that affects your ability to create and nurture new brain cells. So Christina's now going to sort of take us through diet, because we figured that there's just, we can only cover a couple of areas tonight, um, and diet is extremely important, of course, because that's one of the big things we put in our bodies. Christina. So oh, diet. So um, what we're doing with diet, and this is an interesting thing. Am I still a speaker view for you guys? Okay. Yeah, you're good. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so for diet, you want a, there's a couple components that we're going to talk about. So first of all, you want a diet health, high and healthy fats. I think that's extremely important, especially since fat has gotten a bad name in the past. And I think we'll, we're going to go into that later as well. Also an inflammatory diet, an anti-inflammatory diet. So in regards to anti-inflammatory diets, there's two things that you want to think about. Is one, what could be sensitive foods to you personally? And then what are inflammatory foods to everybody, which is kind of processed foods, processed meats, mm. uh, high sugar foods. So those are inflammatory to everybody. Low glycemic, and this is how food <coughs> increases blood sugar. And so they're low glycemic and they're high glycemic foods. A lot of the processed foods are high glycemic foods. Like there are high GI fr fruits and starchy foods, sugary drinks. A couple examples are watermelon, white mm -hmm. rice, cereal, honey, french fries. And then we also are coming to high fiber foods. So foods that move through the digestive tract, but allowing it to um, optimally function. So you want to add those into your diet for neurogenesis as well. You're back. <laughs> Am I? <laughs> you are, you're back. Yeah, no yeah. problem. And, um, and you also want, so these high fiber foods, we've got beans, legumes, oats, berries, avocados, coconut figs, artichokes, peas, black beans, 
So those are all examples of high fiber foods that can, you can integrate into your diet. Ox antioxidant rich foods. These are the foods Charles and I were just talking about, which keep you young and protect you against free radicals. So the antioxidant rich foods we're always talking about, the big one, obviously blueberries. So foods that are definitely like um, high in colors, colorful fruits and vegetables. You had a great uh, metaphor for, well, not metaphor, but a simile for, um, for oxidants, which was... Um... Oh, they're like the anti-rusters. So <laughs> if you think of your, about your body rusting, these are the foods that you integrate into your body to stay young and not rust. So I really like that one. So yeah. Charles, why don't you come into the evolution of the diet for a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Um, there's an interesting sort of theory brought up that um, that our bodies haven't evolved as fast as our brains and whether our brains have evolved or not. Well, they have, obviously, uh, but in recent times. And the, one of the biggest differences has been um, the diet in comparison to evolution in that basically until relatively recently in human history, we, we ate um, wild plants, meat, fish, um, and that's how our body has adapted to its environment. And the other thing that we were talking about was seasonality, is that we do not have any seasonality at all anymore. So the, the interesting thing would be with seasonality is that um, nowadays sugary foods are ever present in everything, absolutely everything, and you can get it, you can get a quick sugar fix immediately. And, but in past times, and even I think almost since the 1950s really, where food really radically changed, is that sugary fruits were only available in season. And so you might gorge on them if you, know, if you found a fantastic apple tree or whatever it might be out on the savannah. If apple trees exist on the savannah, I don't know. Um, and therefore you would eat them, but you wouldn't have them all year round. So therefore you weren't consuming this quantity of sugar. What seems to have happened in the, since more since the 1950s is the addition of sugar, the addition of salt, the addition of sort of processing into foods in order to make them more attractive. And I think that's one, I mean, we're pretty sure that that's the main reason that we now have uh, an obesity epidemic, certainly in the West if not across the whole world, is partly because we're not eating food seasonally. And most of the food that we're eating all the time is sugary and very, 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 um, very heavy for the body to have to deal with. And we'll get to how that sort of, how the carbohydrates and glycation works in just a moment. Fats, you're gonna talk about fats, Christina? Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. So I think that, <laughs> yeah, so with the fats, I think it's a myth, and we've come across this before, is that fats make you fat, which is not the case. Bad fat um, may, but not all fats are bad, and not all of them clog arteries or cause heart disease. <laughs> and yeah. carbs, there's also these myths about that carbs are bad or good. And I think we need to understand, Charles and I were talking about this before, is that Carbs are fruits and vegetables. So when I talk about carbs, I'm talking about good carbs, fruits, vegetables. I mean, a punnet of blueberries contains, contains, a, contains a ton of carbohydrates. So thinking about carbs, not necessarily putting processed carbs in front of it, because that could be, you know, obviously not optimal. It's um, carbs are good and carbs are bad. Processed foods we know are kind of non-negotiable. They're not that good for your body. They spike insulin levels and they stay in your system for a long time um, and they can not help neurogenesis. And uh, it's interesting as well because um, the brain is composed, uh, I think of about 60% fatty acid, which is DHA which is very similar to omega-3. So again, we're back to, the, to my favorite superfood. Um, and the other 25%, not the other 25%, because there's various other things, but another 25% is cholesterol. Mm. And that really surprised me because, um, you know, cholesterol was, you know, the devil incarnate in your body. Um, but that's not quite the case. And I'm worried for some of my friends who are now 
getting a little bit older who are sort of saying, oh, well, you're taking statins, I'm taking statins. Um, and not all cholesterol is created equal, is it? I mean, because there's some that is um, HDL, which is good cholesterol, which helps with all sorts of different, I'm not sure exactly what cholesterol does apart from clogging your arteries, if it's bad cholesterol, which is the LDL type. Um, but I think it produces the hormones that actually regulate glucose, if I'm not mistaken. I hope that's right. And the other thing is that, um, that within, all, within that, you've also got the, the, another thing that you should be consuming for your brain, of course, is monosaturated fats, such as olive oil, avocados, and my new favorite that I'm really pleased that we found out about, butter. <laughs> I love butter and I hate margarine. Absolutely hate margarine. But butter apparently is not so bad for you. And I don't fully understand why. Um, but ob obviously olive oil, well known. Avocados, very well known. Um, and the other thing about saturated fats, which might surprise some of you, or maybe you all know this already, is that grass-fed meat is full of good saturated fats. Yogurt, coconut oil, that one surprised me too. Um, and I don't know whether you want to say, well, of course, I'm going to mention fish again yes. and omega-3, but um, I don't know if you want to say anything about vegetable oil, um, well, Christina. I think I think we're going to come up to vegetable oil, but um, in the oxidation process. Okay. Well, back to you with sugar, carbohydrates. So and sugar and carbohydrates. We talked about, I think this is really, it almost goes along with that sugar spike or inflammation, but sugar, carbs become sugars. And then when blood sugar levels rise, the pancreas secretes insulin and allows cells to use a glucose. So, mm -hmm. but... Like Charles was talking about before, too much all the time, kind of like cortisol, which we've talked about before, too much insulin all the time, we, have, we create an insulin resistance, which is type 2 diabetes. And so our, our bodies mm. just get resistant to, to that spike and then, and then it um, causes all sorts of problems. So the other thing is that we wanted to mention about sugars is fats exposed to high glucolo glucose levels glycate and chronic inflammation ensures so ensues so i think like so that's kind of the sugar inflammation idea right there reduction mm -hmm. in carbs and sugars and unhealthy fats promote your neuro neurogenesis so we can say reduction i want to just clarify that reduction of unhealthy carbohydrates um, and unhealthy processed sugars and unhealthy fats and we're going to talk about oxygen oxid oxidation in a second, um, all of those are, are things that we want to avoid mm. um, in exactly. talking about neurogenesis. So oxidation. So this is what we were talking about just before about our resting. So oxidative stress yeah. tears down cells and produces inflammation. So oxidative stress can be from what you eat to environmental toxins to toxins you put into your body from cleaning products to pollution. So, and then the other thing about oxidation, and this is why one of my non-negotiables when I'm talking about reducing inflammation in the diet is oxidizing fat. So vegetable oils, a lot of vegetable oils are very, very bad for you. And because they say vegetable, people think that they're okay. Mm. Um, but what they do is they <coughs> oxidize, especially at higher heat. Some of the vegetable oils that are actually are okay, like the canolas, the peanuts, they're all very bad for neurogenesis. Um, olive oil sprinkled on your salads, great. Used in cooking, not so great. So if you're cooking, what you wanna think about is ghee, which is clarified butter or grass-fed butter. Those are the two things that I would recommend cooking with. You know, limit or avoid or get rid of any kind of canola oil, peanut oil, safflower, sunflower, anything like that, um, because it doesn't do anything for your neurogenesis at all. In fact, the one, the one that amazes me in that is ghee. Because yeah. over here where we have a lot of Indian food and they use a lot of ghee, we always think that ghee is uh, incredibly bad for you and incredibly fat inducing. But is that not the case? No, it's not the case. And in, in fact, like 
gain grass fed butters. I mean, we know we need healthy fats for the brain. I think we went on this no fat makes you fat diet mm -hmm. in the nineties and we haven't recovered exactly from that. Um, and so ghee grass fed butters and they don't oxidize like we've, you know, I think yeah. they don't oxidize like the other fats. And we were talking about that just a little bit before and how they actually produce a coating on your myelin sheath. But moving forward, so fresh fruits and vegetables um, contain the antioxidants like we talked about, blueberries, really high colored fruits and vegetables, that's what you wanna add in. Um, flavonoids, again, fruits with, some, with high color. Chocolate. chocolate, don't forget chocolate. Don't forget and chocolate. Chocolate. chocolate is a great I'm now one. authorized to eat chocolate. Yes, dark chocolate. <laughs> So, Ooh, can't do without chocolate. Yeah. Um, so chronic inflammation, and I think this is the main thing. We eat every day. So reducing inflammation in your diet helps your brain in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So chronic inflammation um, speeds aging, stiffens blood vessels. You have high glycemic foods, which cause more inflammation, and and foods that can cause that can increase neurogenesis and decrease inflammation. So as we talked about our kind of top ones, blueberries and omegas. I think those are blueberries and omega-3s, fish. Um, those are the things that we definitely want to add in. Green tea and um, which <laughs> and I me. both said that we have to add honey to. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I, oh, I, well, I, add honey to. I said, I don't really like blueberries. In fact, I don't, <laughs> oh, I'm not you don't like fan tea of fruit. Either. So. Yeah. And green tea, well, I do try to drink it from time to time, but it's quite bitter and it's quite yeah, nice. This is better. And it leaves a terrible scum on the cup as well. So I'm not sure about that. Oh but it's very good to you. So a couple so of other find ones. an alternative. We, uh, okay, well, just pick from the list. I think it's, I think the <laughs> point here that we're getting at is like, do what you can and kind of take from the list what you want. So blueberries, berries of any sort, your omega-3s, you really want to think about salmons and your nice white fish. Um, yeah, we were talking also about mercury. Bit about that. And w when you start to increase your intake of fish, you want to think about mercury as well, as we know, and I'm sure everybody's heard of that as well. And those are in the yeah. old fishes, in the tunas in the, and the yeah. sharks and the things like that, um, swordfish. So you want to limit your kind of um, older fish and you want to always get your wild caught salmons and um, nice white fish as well. Curcumin um, in turmeric. So curcumin is a, a very big anti-inflammatory. Um, whole soy foods, you do not want processed soy foods, mm. but whole soy foods, very good. <laughs> Ginseng, ginkgo biloba, um, both of those I think you find more in supplement form. Chocolate or cacao mm. as well. Um, melatonin, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of melatonin. Obviously, we know that promotes a healthy sleep. Um, and they're also using it in different cancer studies as well. I think that's really interesting. Well, and also um, melatonin is now being used a lot in, um, in regulating uh, our, um, what's it called? Uh, not just our sleep patterns, but also our weight patterns as well, yeah. particularly in um, aging um, people as well. And there's been quite a lot of studies in that, uh, as with circadian rhythms as well, and um, working within sort of more natural circadian rhythms that, um, and I know this from one of the um, care homes that we were working with, is that they found also, and there's quite a lot of sort of academic studies on it, that um, Working with your with circadian rhythms, particularly with people in um, age old age homes, um, does improve their quality of life by meaning they're less likely to fall, less likely to be tired, much less aggressive as well, and that's all working with sort of natural um, light and darkness as well as um, keeping the food well balanced as well, and not having high sugar spikes and things like that. Um, the other thing that we were we we we've got to mention, and has become really popular at the moment, is intermittent fasting. And um, I think I'm pretty much right in saying that this has now been proven yeah. to be beneficial. Yeah. And that you should have a period, even if you can't fast for a whole day or whatever, you should have a period where you um, 
do not ingest anything at all for about 12 hours. So you could do that from eight in the evening to late in the morning or something like that. Um, we've got a, a sort of a, a BBC, I think it's BBC program with uh, Michael Mosley, who's a doctor who has really promoted the sort of the fasting diet of sort of, I think it's two days on and one day or half a day off or re reduced calorie intake. And um, I think they've shown quite conclusively now that it, that it certainly is a better method of losing weight and of regulating your metabolism, but also of um, improving cognitive uh, sort of awareness and involvement. So yeah, so um, I think intermittent fasting is something that's quite easy to take up if you just increase the span between the time that you, um, you stop eating and then you start eating again in the morning. And you were saying as well about um, how you should, what you should eat first or what you should ingest. Yeah. So think about it. So if you, a lot of people already do intermittent fasting without even thinking about it. If you stop mm -hmm. eating at six, dinner and then you start eating again at six or seven in the morning then that's that's your fast that's totally fine the most important thing that you want to remember is that your first meal after you break your fast is very important it's very important to your brain health it's very important to your energy level throughout the day it ensures mm -hmm. that if you you know if you have something that's um processed and high in sugar you're probably going to have a dip quite early in the day you want to be eating something that allows you to be full for the longest amount of time. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of things that we, we haven't really covered, and I'm going to just sort of very briefly go over some of them. So um, over, hold on a second, Charles. Um, yeah, sure. I think we wanted to talk about the body and the environment first. Yeah. So that's what I'm just about to get to. Oh, cool. So Yeah, yeah. So I think what gets underestimated quite often is um, other external things that make a huge difference to your quality of life. And again, this is now sort of um, reasonably scientifically proven. Um, and these things are aerobic exercise, which um, has uh, an enormous effect on the body. And as I said, if there was ever a magic bullet, then this would be it, I think, is exercise, um, keeping your weight down, keeping your metabolism going, or encouraging your metabolism, keeping reasonably flexible, and all of these things release all kinds of wonderful hormones um, and um, chemicals throughout your body. If, if doing nothing else than just pumping your blood around a bit faster for a time, surely that must clean through all your veins and arteries, which is what you need. Um, another really interesting one uh, that comes up particularly in the book by uh, Brent Portright is touch human contact. And that's quite tricky at the moment um, for a lot of people being quite isolated. But um, human touch has been shown and the studies that I remember uh, on this are with again slightly older people who have adopted a pet or taken on a pet that petting does reduce the reduces blood pressure reduces heart rate calms people um, and this is partly due to this physical contact um, so i think i mean i wouldn't be surprised if on the nhs here you could be prescribed a little puppy or something that'd be nice wouldn't it that'd be cute um, sex i'm afraid sex is very good for you so uh, we all need to do more of it. So just uh, move on. Sleep. <laughs> Seven to eight hours a night. Um, now, I very rarely sleep a full sort of seven or eight hours. But I always wake up without the alarm anyway and always have done. So I, don't, I suppose it's a question really of finding your own levels with this. Yeah, it uh, is. And I do think with sleep... It is the quality of sleep. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that eight hours ensures that that's enough time if the quality of sleep isn't exactly right. Whereas maybe you're getting a high quality <coughs> sleep for sure. <coughs> the other thing that they've shown, of course, is that a lot of neurogenesis happens in sleep. And, um, in and 
they, they're, they're not quite sure, but they're working on studies and there are studies out there at the moment that the brain needs to sort and consolidate memory as well and repair and clear toxins. Now, um, this also, um, I think, relates to a lot of what's happening with Alzheimer's research in terms of um, the amyloids and the tau uh, proteins in terms of being able to clear them, that they are naturally occurring, but the brain does need to clear them down. The same thing happens with um, neurons as well, is that they do get pruned, they do get trimmed, you know, like having a haircut or something. You've got to use the ones that you use, um, and that's why you need new ones. Um, and a lack of sleep, and I don't know how anybody could ever deny this, leads to cognitive decline. You cannot possibly function if you haven't slept well or are rested. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, people who work maybe, and I shouldn't stereotype, but I will a little bit, is people who work in the city who say that, you know, sleep is for wimps and lunch is for wimps, and uh, they're wrong. They're completely wrong. And uh, uh, tons and tons and tons of proof and studies show that people who try to pull an all-nighter and uh, work very, very long hours are actually not very productive. They do better to go and get a bit of sleep and a bit of rest. So one of the best books on that is Matthew Walker, um, oh, Why wow. We Sleep. Oh, yeah. Because there's been a lot of stuff out Ooh. lately in the last two years, I think, about sleep. Mm. Um, and it's really interesting. I haven't really got around to reading much of it, except via sort of some of the reading that I'm doing at the moment. Now, the other big thing, the other massive thing that you shouldn't miss out on is doing new things. Doing new things stimulates your brain, which then encourages and nurtures neurogenesis, which the whole point of neurogenesis is not just to make lots and lots and lots of neurons because you wouldn't know what to do with them, is because that leads to a ha happier, healthier life and a better emotional life as well and being more able to deal with um, with problems with uh, stress with fear with all those sorts of things but doing new things really does stimulate your brain now i'd like to think of it and i know it's not absolutely correct i like to think of it that that is then the uh, the genesis of uh, finding new neural pathways new routes to sort of understand things to make connections to make new connections uh, so the broader the better um, as I was saying when I when I had a design company I would uh, fanatically insist that everybody get out and see exhibitions shows uh, grungy stuff bad stuff good movies bad movies read stuff you need to feed it you really do need to feed your brain so I think doing new things and and i think i think i'm not mistaken in saying that um that there was a report out that learning a language mm. uh, or a musical instrument in older age is incredibly good for your brain and your brain health what there isn't though what there isn't much proof on is uh, whether all these mental games and apps and all the rest actually do anything more than just make you better at sudoku or whatever it might be I don't think that's the case with chess because chess is kind of special, mm. of course. Um, the other thing is sensory stimulation. Uh, you do need to feed your senses as well. Um, and this, this goes also along with uh, brain plasticity is that if you lose or if you, one of your centers is impaired, your brain will try to heighten other senses to compensate or to work ways around it. Um, the other thing is music and silence, uh, two things that uh, are very, very, very uh, beneficial for your brain. Again, proven Mozart is apparently very, very good for working too, if you have it not too loud, I guess. And silence as well. I think, to be honest, I think we could do a whole uh, webinar on silence and just being quiet because nobody or very few people, I should say, stop and do nothing you know and and i and apparently your brain really needs sometimes just to sort of say i'm not doing anything right this moment so if we keep sort of feeding it with things that we do then 
I think it gets distracted from some of its tasks, which must be sort of reorganizing, sorting, and just allowing ideas to flow as well. And the other thing is nature. Nature is very, very good for your brain. So you do need to get out and walk and see and do and be involved in it. I mean, gardening is also, um, I mean, that's been one of my big things is um, just mucking about in the garden, particularly if I get stressed, that really works. So there's, uh, yeah, so there's a lot of things that we, we just couldn't possibly cover today because we're just about out of time. Um, and some of them are my pet favorite subjects. Um, one of them is emotion and how emotion is involved in almost everything we do. Uh, you can't function without it, but we, we can't really go into it, except to say that um, neurogenesis is um, very important in stabilizing and regulating emotional responses as well. So if you imagine everything's going to go somehow through the hippocampus and then the amygdala in terms of whether you fear, flight or whatever, that uh, emotional regulation is a very, very important factor within all of this and emotional stability, obviously. Uh, stress, we haven't really talked about stress too much. We've mentioned it quite a few times. We haven't really talked about it, uh, but it is also a significant factor in neurogenesis. Mind and mental function, I've just mentioned a little bit about doing new things, finding novelty, interest, um, doing things that stimulate you that are interesting. Um, and the other thing we definitely can't talk about today is cognitive, de de cognitive decline and dementia. And there's a lot of stuff coming out now about um, Alzheimer's dementia, particularly as they think they may have found the, the, the triggers for um, Alzheimer's, I think particularly, but certain other forms of dementia. But the problem is how do they find it early enough and can they identify the possibility of the amyloid and the tau buildup? Um, and the one that really sort of, um, sort of surprised me, but doesn't surprise me at all is spiritual benefits, is that spirituality really does help your quality of life and helps neurogenesis. But the main point is, is that neurogenesis is the, um, the driver, the method by which we have a happier, healthier life. And that, that we can support by supporting our uh, bodies, what we ingest, um, what we do, what we stimulate ourselves with, and all of those things. And there's, and avoiding poisons. Don't poison yourself. Don't do stupid things. Uh, but the poisons that are difficult to deal with are things like inflammation, of course, and there are lots of different types of inflammation. Christina knows a lot more about it than I do, I've got to say. Chronic stress as well um, is very, very difficult to get out of because it becomes a recurring circle. Uh, physical assaults as well also do have an impact on the brain as well. <coughs> and deprivation, and this was the, the big example with, um, with mice and then with uh, monkeys, was showing that deprived environments deprive your brain just as much as everything. I mean, it sounds so obvious, um, but uh, it's very, very, very difficult to keep an active and healthy mind if your environment is deprived. Uh, we might need to talk to Terry Waite or someone like that who was um, in solitary confinement for what, four years or something? Um, whilst he was taken as a hostage to find out what happens. But I think he had a very, a very healthy attitude. Um, and any kind of toxins, just don't do it, basically. Um, so I would advise everybody to, if I can proffer some advice, <coughs> is to um, look at what you're eating, um, look at what you're doing physically, look at what you're um, taking in as well, in terms of stimulation, and, uh, and make sure you sleep properly. So those are the pieces of advice that will increase neurogenesis. And don't take in any toxins. <laughs> and that means uh, listening to too much political crap on the TV as well, because that's not very good for your brain, I'm sure. Yeah. Interesting, but not very good.
So that's, that's where we are today. Um, I'm going to be taking a break for three or four weeks um, just to get some other things done. Um, but Christina and Jana, I think, are doing the next one. Christina, yeah. do you want to tell us what so, it's all about? Yeah, so a couple of things. So Charles <laughs> and I, coming back, when, he come, when we come back in October, we definitely have some things that we're going to announce including um, a, a membership site and, and obviously more webinars and more educational pieces. So I'm really excited about that. And so Charles is going to be working very hard in his time off. <laughs> I am. And, um, and in addition to my course being on as well, um, all about anti-inflammatory um, tactics. So Yana and I, Yana is an artist and, um, and also uh, our creative course designer um, for something that we have planned as well. And we'll be talking next week. It'll be a time change. So it'll be 2 p.m. Mountain time, which I think is nine o'clock your time, Charles. We'll yeah. also have those recorded. Um, we'll put them both up on, on both of our YouTubes as well. Um, but it will be about conserving energy. So we'll talk about how to reduce stress by conserving energy, whether it's what you take in, whether you reduce inflammation, um, whether it's the kind of movement that you're doing, is it productive or non-productive? Um, so that's going to be a very interesting one. So I mm. hope you can join us. Great. I look forward to that. I know. I will, Charles I will come and listen. Yes. I'll be there. Yeah. Okay. Great to see everyone. Uh, be well. See you all very, very soon. And Thank you so hopefully much. join in next week. Yeah. <laughs> see ya. Yeah.